Welcome to the George Eastman Museum. The museum is located on the estate of George Eastman, the founder of the Eastman Kodak Company here in Rochester, New York. The actual museum includes George Eastman's 50-room colonial revival style home, four formal gardens, and a museum of photography and film, which changes exhibits on a regular basis. In the summer of 1928, George Eastman hosted a press conference here with Thomas Edison. He introduced an early color motion picture film. It actually was black and white film, but you took the movie in a camera with a three color filter, and then when you got ready to project it and show the final product, you actually used a filter on that projector. So it gave the illusion of color. All the people he invited were radio and newspaper people, so they came to document this new invention. It really did not become popular with the general public because it was so expensive, but it was how Hollywood got its start in color movies. We are standing in George Eastman's dining room. He regularly had breakfast with his mom here in this room at a table that was near the, the bay windows. And we have the table today set up for a family dinner. Mr. Eastman had place cards made for all his friends and family members at, for most of the um, parties and family dinners. But he was also known to give um, beautiful orchids that he grew in his greenhouses to all the ladies that came to dinner parties. He had an, a very large household staff to help him with entertaining in the house and gardens. And you can see there's a beautiful silver safe where he stored all of the china, the crystal, and the silver that would have been used in his home for these parties and dinners. I want to be able to show this, if you, can I do that? So, yeah. so this is a special plate, not one that everyone has in their set of dishes at home. This is a bone dish and it was part of Mr. Eastman's 40-piece place setting of mint in China. It has his monogram, the GE, on it, as does the silver and the tablecloths and most of the things in his silver safe. This would have been used right at the top of the plate to collect the bones from fish or chicken or turkey or fowl during any of the meals. The wood in this room is a bleached oak. It has a lime wash on it, which gives it that gray color. The furniture is all mahogany, and the majority of chairs around the dining room table are original. We have made some reproductions so we could have a set of six or eight when we set the table each week. Mr. Eastman grew these large orchids in his um, greenhouses here on the property. And when he would have his luncheons with his lady friends called the Lobster Quartet, he would give each one of them one of these orchids to wear. And they were usually presented in a white box with the lilac tissue paper that you see inside. Mr. Eastman loved lemon pie. And he had a recipe which he felt was better than most of his friends or acquaintances. So he would bring one of his pies to every dinner party he was invited to. And he would hope that his was eaten before all the rest of the desserts to prove his point that he made a really great lemon pie. We have the pie here in this room on one of his original cake plates that actually has been returned to the museum from his relatives who inherited the set after the Dryden's death and Mr. Eastman's death. This is George Eastman's conservatory. And a conservatory meant that you would not only have lots of plants growing here in the room, as you can see, but also you would listen to music in this space as well. 
and Eastman had a huge Aeolian pipe organ that was built into his home, and the pipes are hidden on different levels. But when you sat in this room for concerts or music house, you could hear a 3D sort of a two-dimensional sort of sound. Music coming from the north pipes here and from the south pipes up above. So he had stereo sound in his home way before it was common in America. In addition to that, as you can see, Mr. Eastman loved to hunt. The big elephant that's right behind us is a reproduction elephant, but it matches the one George Eastman brought back from his safari in 1928 to Africa. In addition to having parties here, Mr. Eastman had this lovely wicker furniture that he could move out to the gardens from this room and set up different little chairs for his concerts, but it was also a room he could dance in and have balls in as well. In addition, the beautiful grill work that's along the north wall here was created by Samuel Yellen from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's known for doing a lot of the grill work at um, the Grand Central Terminal and in other museums like the Smithsonian. When George Eastman first moved into the house, this room was a square. It was 30 by 30. George Eastman felt the proportions of the room could be expanded to make more room for his concerts and musicals, and he believed it would make the sound of that music sound better. So in 1919, he had the house cut in half using all kinds of um, equipment that we would never use today. Donkeys, horses, railroad ties to pull what was a steel reinforced concrete structure apart. Seven, nine feet four inches to be able to expand this little end cap here. So now the room is 30 by 40 in dimension and you can see we've had to add an extra bay of windows for that rectangular room. George Eastman lived in this house with only one other person, and that was his mom, Mariah Kilborn Eastman. She lived with him from 1905 till 1907. And when they first moved in, she had fallen and broken her hip and was confined to a wheelchair. So what should have been a dumbwaiter to take food up and down the different levels became an Otis elevator that we still use today. It allowed her to get in in the wheelchair and get to the second and third floors of the mansion. George Eastman had ample flower gardens surrounding his home, and he regularly had his household staff cut those flowers for arrangements in all the different rooms of his home. Even if he didn't have company in the guest rooms, fresh flowers were placed in those rooms on a weekly basis. The flower arrangement right here is a perfect example of what Eastman liked, a mixture of flowers, but a similar color palette. We call them monochromatic flower arrangements, and we continue to do those same arrangements today. This is George Eastman's billiard room. The walls in this room are all teak that have been brought in from Burma to decorate this room, as are the floors. Many people refer to the floors as like the decks of a ship with all the bow ties. Mr. Eastman loved to have friends over for a game of billiards before dinner or before some of his Sunday musicals. The billiard table here in the room is not his original, but it is from the home of his lawyer, Mr. Hubble, down the street, and he did play on that table when both of them were alive. We also have a, a pool cue rack and ivory balls that were used in that time period to play the game of billiards. And Eastman loved cards. So we have a card table in the room that could open for four to six people to play poker or gin or contract bridge, which was another game that he enjoyed. George Eastman loved music. 
And in this room, he had a couple of different ways to listen to music. He had some vintage radios that he could tune on some of the concerts that were recorded in our local radio stations, specifically Wham, which he had founded. But also he had an early Edison cylinder phonograph machine, which has little cylinders that you can pop in and play music when you were entertaining. And I'll be happy to play one of those for you so you can see how it works. George Eastman loved to travel, and he traveled all over the world during his lifetime. The stained glass roundels you see encircling this billiard room are all representative of different means of transportation that were in existence at the turn of his century. He rode his bike through the flower fields in Holland or the Netherlands. That's how we got the idea to bring bulbs home and force them in his greenhouses and have our annual flower show called the Dutch Connection. He also took a transatlantic um, vessel to England when he did many of his patents and some of his business dealings there. He had horses and carriages um, here at his home for his visitors to use when um, they were in town. And of course, the Erie Canal boat was typical at his time period. All of these stained glass roundels were made and put into these leaded glass windows when we did our restoration in 1989 and 1990, and they were all done by the Willett Stained Glass Company in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is George Eastman's little library. Many joke that they would all love to have a library like this in their home. When Eastman first moved in, this was a rece receiving room. You had to receive your guests before either a concert or dinner because it was during Prohibition where one could not have an alcoholic drink before the particular event that you were invited to. But in 1926, after Prohibition ended, Eastman was able to turn that reception room into his little library. And he had two local librarians from the University of Rochester come here, organize and catalog his books. We actually have small little card catalogs like you'd find in a public library. They're all hidden in the little drawers beneath the bookshelves. And it tells you exactly where each book in his collection would be located. Every shelf here has a letter of the alphabet. It starts with A, and in this room goes through P. It continues in the living room on the other shelves with the rest of his book collection. We have probably about 85 to 95 percent of his books, original ones, back in the collection today. Many of them have come back to us from relatives and family members who inherited them at his death and some of them came from the University of Rochester as the presidents of that school lived here for about 15 years after George Eastman's death. This is one of George Eastman's original books from his collection and if you open it you can see the black and white book plate that George Eastman had created for each of the books in his library. The section is K and the shelf is number three. So anyone that had removed the book or borrowed it could then know where to return it when they brought it back to Mr. Eastman. And each of these locations was indicated on the index card in the file drawers. So we are standing in the front hall of George Eastman's home. And even though he had this most glamorous entrance, most of his friends and family did not use this door to come to the house. They used the back door, or the side door under the porte cochere. This is a perfect place to talk about George Eastman's 35,000 square foot home, colonial revival in style, with 15 bedrooms, 13 bathrooms, and nine fireplaces. Most of the guest rooms, bathrooms, and sitting rooms were up on the second floor. And on the third floor, George Eastman had his own dark room where he could process his own photographic prints, his own workshop with all of his tools where he could prepare all of his camping equipment for many of his trips. And it was also, the third floor was where the household staff that lived on site had their rooms with a shared bath. So it was a very busy house with lots of staff um, constantly working here, keeping it clean, keeping fresh flowers, as well as serving all of the different guests that he hosted throughout his time period.
This is George Eastman's living room. As you can see from the many paintings that adorn the walls, George Eastman loved art and he was an avid collector. Upon his death, most of his art collection was given to the Memorial Art Gallery here in Rochester, but a few of the paintings were given to family members. Those original paintings have come back from the family members and now adorn the walls here in the living room. We also have a beautiful original Steinway piano that belonged to George Eastman from houses that he lived in prior to 900 East Avenue. He brought it with him every place he moved and it is the focal point in the room for concerts and music house that he had here regularly for his friends and family. He also used this room to have a lot of the board meetings or the corporate meetings for the many organizations that he served in our community. The United Way, the Rochester um, Red Cross, the Memorial Art Gallery, the Eastman School of Music, the Eastman Theater, as well as the University of Rochester Medical and Dental Center. A lot of those corporate and board meetings were held here in the room around the beautiful round mahogany table. The other thing I'd like to point out in the room is the beautiful painting of his mom, Mariah Kilborn Eastman, who is painted in a rocking chair, but she had already fallen and broken her hip, and so the wheelchair that she was in was actually painted out of that. It was done by Julius Rolshevin, an actual local painter, and it has always hung on the walls in the living room. The silk damask wall coverings are beautiful and are reminiscent of exactly what Eastman had here when he was alive, although these are reproduction patterns that you see today. We are standing on the second floor of Mr. Eastman's home. Right behind us is the South Organ Chamber. Mr. Eastman loved music, as I mentioned, and so he installed an Aeolian pipe organ in his home. Initially, it was just in the south area of the mansion. He eventually added a whole north organ chamber, a swell chamber, and an echo chamber. Over the years, parts of the organ did not work. And so we have gotten a group of local volunteers that have really spearheaded the organ restoration project. It is kept in tune by the Parsons Pipe Organ Company in Canandaigua, but we have the organ volunteers here every Monday actually doing work and preparation to get all of these pipes playable again. George Eastman was a bachelor. He never married, did not have any children. So the only person that lived with him in this home was his mom, Mariah Kilborn Eastman. She had a room with two beds, and people always ask why. It was because she was in her 80s when she lived in this house, and she was ailing. She had a lot of bronchial problems, pneumonia, Many times her granddaughter came to stay with her, which explains the two beds. She also did have a live-in nurse, and the little bell on the table was to ring for the nurse if she really needed some major medical help. Mrs. Eastman was confined to a wheelchair while she was here at George Eastman's home at 900 East Avenue, and so some accommodations needed to be made for her. The doorways are a lot wider than they would have been in a typical home. An elevator was installed so she could get up and down the different levels. And in many ways, Mr. Eastman gave her the bedroom with the best view of the gardens so she could see them change seasonally without ever having to go outside. You'll also notice throughout the mansion there are little call buttons. Hers in this bedroom, bathroom, and closet are a little lower so she could reach them easily in her wheelchair. So George Eastman's home had quite a few extensive bedrooms, bathrooms, closets, and sitting rooms, especially for his mom and he, they were quite large. 
You can see one of the vintage tubs behind us here and the beautiful tiles that were typical of all the bathrooms. We have outfitted it with the typical linens and medicines of the time period and even some of the vintage night dresses um, and also clothing in the closet. But again, from Mrs. Eastman's bathroom, you have the best view of the terrace garden and how it would change seasonally. So in every aspect, he tried to please his mom with the design of her home as well as her particular rooms. This is um, the sitting room of George Eastman's mom, Mariah Kilborn Eastman. We've chosen to make it into an exhibit space where we can show some paintings of George Eastman and his family, as well as do some exhibits on George Eastman's life, doing different things from different years, usually looking back a hundred or so years at activities going on in his lifetime. Behind me is a portrait of George Eastman, and it is one of the few of him actually standing up. Almost every painting or photograph made of him was him sitting down, so it's just sort of a shoulder to waist kind of view. And then the two sort of blanking him on each side is his mom, Mariah Kilborn Eastman, and then his dad, George Washington Eastman. Both of those paintings were painted many years after they had passed away from early daguerreotypes, photographs that George Eastman had on copper of each of his parents. So those photographs were used as a guide and these paintings were made for George Eastman to have likenesses of his parents in his home. The other portrait in the room is of his niece, Ellen Dryden, and she was as close to Mr. Eastman as almost a daughter would be. Um, George Eastman hosted her husband and her and their children regularly here at his home, and he traveled with them extensively, spent many holidays with them in Evanston, Illinois, which was their hometown. Um, it was Ellen and her husband, George Dryden, that gave the museum the money in 1950 to build our Dryden Theater. It's where we host all of the movies each weeknight at 7.30 for visitors as well as for the general public here in Rochester to come and see vintage and contemporary films. On March 14, 1932, George Eastman called a number of Kodak executives and his secretary of 42 years, Alice K. Whitney Hutchison, to his home to sign a new codicil to his will, his last will and testament. He brought all those people here to be witnesses to, of this signed document, along with his lawyers. After he was done signing the document and chatting with each of the people that were present about their family, their kid at college, the big fish they caught in Florida last year and if they had had it stuffed or taxidermied now. Um, he made it a point to have a conversation with everyone. After people had left, they heard gunshots. There were two or three people left in the room and George Eastman had taken his own life after he did what, in my mind, was his final act of philanthropy, deciding who would get the bulk of his estate not only his family and friends and people that had worked for him over the years at his home, but also the University of Rochester, which he felt was a key organization in our community that raised the level of the education for our local people and also attracted the people he needed for his company. George Eastman was dying of a disease that today we would know as spinal stenosis. He knew he was becoming hunchback. Every day he was basically walking, basically hunchback like this to get in and out of the house. He always arrived at Kodak an hour or more before any meeting because he didn't want people to see him in that condition. He waited till the meeting was done and then left after everyone else had exited. He was very concerned that he would end up in a wheelchair, just as his mother had been, and as his younger sister had been when she had polio. He did not want to end up in a wheelchair. 
He was not married. He didn't have kids to take care of him. He would have been ringing a bell for household staff to come and care for him. And that is not how he wanted the end of his life to go. And so he chose on March 14th, 1932, to take his own life after redoing his will and leaving everything to the University of Rochester, where he felt more people could benefit from you know, a good education, but also a dental school, a medical school, all of those resources here. So his will basically was changed to leave everything to the University of Rochester as an endowment that they still survive on till this day. In my mind, it was his final act of philanthropy. Even though George Eastman was a bachelor, he always managed to surround himself with beautiful women. Three of his favorites were Alice K. Whitney Hutchison House, who was basically his secretary for 42 years at the Eastman Kodak Company. She ran the company in his absence when he traveled. He was really, um, he considered her a confidant and somebody very responsible in his absence. The other one is a close friend, Mary Durand Mulligan, happened to be a, the sister of his close friend, Henry Durand, and also a person who together, they both donated land for the Durand Eastman Park here in our community. The other or group of ladies I wanted to talk about was um, four lady friends that were affectionately known as the Lobster Quartet. They came together every Saturday here at Mr. Eastman's home they had lobster for lunch, and they listened to music on the pipe organ that was actually played by one of the husbands of one of the lobster quartets, Marion Gleason. Um, they would lunch with Eastman. They were sort of the um, friends who did testimonials for his products. He would give them cameras, ask them to test them out, and if they had issues with them, he would go back to the drawing board or to the engineers to correct things based on their recommendations. But these were the ladies he socialized with, and in really, in many ways, was he, you, he had a, a pipeline, so to speak, on how normal, everyday people were living and what they were looking for in cameras, equipment, in their life. It was those friends that really helped him, I feel, place the ads and do the marketing that was necessary for his Kodak products. Mr. Eastman made his fortune in the photographic industry. And to, as an example, we're standing here in the Kodak camera gallery. This was a camera that the Kodak company came out with in 1888. It was considered totally automatic at the time. You had to be able to just hold the camera up, sort of breast high, pull up the little stretch thing to take the picture, press the button, and then turn a crank at the top to advance the film. If you did all three steps correctly, right, you had taken one photographic image. The camera came loaded with enough film to take 100 photographs or 100 images. He gave you a little notebook and a pencil so you could keep track of every one of those exposures so you'd know when it was time to take your camera, put it in a big sort of wooden box and mail it back to the Eastman Company here in Rochester, New York, which at the time was the only place that could process your film for you. Eventually, Eastman created the photo finishing industry, so no matter where you lived and bought his film and his product, you could also process that film there as well. But that camera and its automatic nature, because you no longer had to process your own film, really revolutionized the photographic industry and the Eastman Kodak Company's business. Thank you so much for joining us today for this special tour of the George Eastman House. 
I encourage you if you have questions or want to learn more about Eastman, his company, or his home and gardens, that you contact the people in the George Eastman Archive and Study Center and make an appointment to do some research yourself. Thank you.